in a little while, Jesus may have to pick me up off the floor when my nerves get to rattling. Or maybe I'll forget what I'm supposed to be saying. So I just want to let you know I'm so happy to have had the praise singers Amen. using that song, Jesus Will Lift Me Up. Right. Yeah. I thank you for that. Yeah. But what I want you to do right now is to just close your eyes. Church, close your eyes. And I want you to listen to the words written by a Jewish man by the name of Mirapol, first name Abel. The words that he wrote, southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the roots. Black body swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. In 1939, Billie Holiday recorded those words. And until this day, too many people are not aware that this song was written, or those words were written by a black man. I'm sorry, a Jewish man. The words of that song surely resonates with why we're all here today. But what I really want to do with your help is to dedicate today, yes, to Mr. Daniels. But I want to dedicate today to the innocents. I want to dedicate today to all of the thousands of little children innocent that was at the site of lynchings across this country. As you look at this program, I want you to look at four little white children in the front of this postcard as they witnessed Mr. Elijah Daniels being lynched. And as I have seen the footage from lynchings across this country, too many of those lynchings had little white children bearing witness to this lynchings. And it was probably around 1994, preparing to do a workshop sitting with this white male that was to work with me, and all of a sudden we're looking at the footage, and here was this little white girl at this lynching. And I looked at him, and for the first time, I said, I wonder how did those children survive? At the time, we are learning about life. At a time in our formative years, we have been dragged off by some adults to witness a lynching. That's right. That's right. That's right. And in doing so, it's not just what they saw, but it's what they heard. They heard cheering. Yeah. They probably heard a lot of hallelujahs. They probably heard that God is on our side. They probably said that he deserved to be lynched because he was black and that black people are inferior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What all did those children hear? And so I start asking the question 
And as I ask the question, and I conduct workshops across this country, I would put it out to the universe in audience. How did those white children survive? Did they become drug addicts and alcoholics? <coughs> did any of them have nervous breakdowns? Did any of these children end up incarcerated? Because I understand very well, <coughs> hurt people hurt people. And I can't remember the state, but after putting this out in the audience, a white woman followed me outside. And this woman said to me, as a child, I was taken to a lynching. And I want you to know how I survived. Five different personalities. I don't know how many years it took to integrate all of those personalities. But this is how she was able to survive. And driving here today, my driver, as well as my personal photographer. I want you all to see her, Joyce Steenberg. Stand up. I want you to see her. And while we are driving, I asked and put it out there, I wonder about some of these personalities. Did this child have to develop one personality before the lynching that never ever saw this lynching? Did this child have to develop another personality that says, all black people are good in order to survive. And we were just talking about these personalities. How many different forms of personalities that this child had to develop to survive? Because there is a way the brain have of protecting itself. But then, my husband, where I got that last name from, some of you may be well aware it's a German last name. But for 38 years, I've been sleeping with my husband, Siegfried Steinbender, stand-up Siegfried Steinbender. Oh, right. <laughs> He's videotaping. And so, I really want you to think about the innocence I want you to think about something else too, because according to the history, for that lynching that took place here, there were 1,000 people. 1,000 people that did not have access to social media. Maybe some of them didn't have telephones at that time, but yet and still they managed to send the word out through the grapevine that there would be a lynching. Yeah. Now, with all of the modern day conveniences, I don't even see a thousand people in this church. But you see, I get it. I know bad news travels fast. I also know if it bleeds, it leads. So if we were gonna have a lynching today, I wonder how many people would have showed up. But I want you to know I don't mind going to the pain. I really don't. And in fact, I wanted to really feel the pain because on October the 5th, I was supposed to leave to go to Montgomery, Alabama to visit the lynching museum. Airline ticket purchased, hotel reserved. But on October 1, my husband had major surgery and because of his recovering time, I could not take that trip. But don't worry, my girl, I'll be there next year. <laughs> and I wanted to go into that pain. I wanted to go in and I wanted to really feel it. Because I understand what too many people don't. The way out of the pain is in the pain. If you want to come out, you're going to have to go back in. 
you're going to have to really sit and do a whole lot of praying and meditating on the pain. You're going to have to do some own personal processing about the pain. There's a lot of things. You're going to have to find people that you can talk to about the pain in order to come out whole, in order to come out the other side. The work that I have been doing for 30 years, two countries and 45 states, the work that I have to do it is not to enrage people, but to engage them. And so, when we talk about this pain, I'm going to set up a day of a lynching, and I want to read it because I want it to be very visual. And I want you to really feel and hear, and I want you to sit and put yourself in that day. And so, this is a morning of a lynching in this country. The turnout was strong for a Tuesday. More than 3,000 men, women, and children, by most accounts, thanks to the announcement in the local newspaper about where and when the event would take place. By 9 o'clock a.m., lines of cars choked the Malcolm Road near the Wolf River Bridge, bringing traffic to a standstill. Amidst the excitement, mothers, many in their finest clothing, were willing to overlook the schoolboys play hooky and vendors exhausted their supplies of drinks and snacks much sooner than expected. Then, with anticipation, building and reporters on hand to capture the details. Eli Pearsons was chained to a log, dust with gasoline. Mm -hmm and burned alive. Once Pearson's chattered coughs had cooled, the crowd pressed in to snatch any scrape of birth clothing or rope as a keepsake. The body was decapitated and dismembered, the ears and other parts removed for souvenirs. Person's head and one of his feet, however, would serve another purpose. <coughs> the larger objective of the gruesome spectacle. They were taken to busy Beale Street in the heart of Memphis, African American <coughs> community, and tossed from a car at the feet of a pedestrian with this message. Take this with our compliments. Francis Kendall, one of the people that I am very close to, is one of those heavy social justice activists in this country based in Oakland, California. Her family made their money from cotton in Waco, Texas. They were millionaires. And here, Francis rejected all of that to do this social justice type work. And in one of the workshops I attended that she gave in one of the states across this country, she said, and these are the words of a woman born of financial privilege. She said, we really need to have a lot of research done on the pathology of people like her parents that could go to church on Sunday mornings and sing and pray 
and go to a lynching of a black man in the afternoon and see no conflict with that. And see no conflict with that. And so as we listen, as we pray, as we sing, I do not want you to forget that not too far away from here, your neighbor was hung, but not by a tree, not on a tree, but was lynched behind a pickup truck. James Bird Jr. And to add insult to, you know, to his misery to insult, when he was buried in Jasper, Texas, his grave was desecrated and they had to put a wrought iron fence around his grave. My husband and I took a trip to Jasper and we sat with James Bird Jr.'s mother as she talked about her son. And I was so proud to see the memorial where people from all over the world, not just the United States, sent cards, angels, momentums, and everything. They had to build a separate enclosure outside of the front of their house. And there, in plain sight, was the center for the healing of racism. The way out of the pain is in the pain. And I know very well well, I know firsthand of what this pain feels like. Not the same way that the Daniels family, not for the same reason, but I too know that in order to come out whole, I really needed to go deep within this pain. And some of you may wonder, why? Why? There is no reason that this country can give an offer that will answer that question. Why 4,000 plus lynchings took place from predominantly all people of African descent. It's no answer that could give that would justify it or satisfy it. But what I do know is that no one in this country, because of its laws, that this man should have had a trial and let it play out. But you see, that didn't happen. People took the laws into their own hands. And then within our educational institutions, we're not doing enough talking about what really happened in this country. I'll never forget in watching a documentary where a lot of high school students were taken on a trip to South Africa to visit the slave fortress there. And in that space, Bishop Tutu, along with the late John Franklin, here from the United States, these two men came together. One knew what life was under the apartheid system, the other Jim Crow segregation within the United States. And Bishop Tutu asked John Hope Franklin, do y'all talk about slavery in the United States? And John Hope Franklin <laughs> said, I am sorry to say that we have complicated our situation almost to the point of hopelessness by our refusal to remember, by our refusal to talk about it. And then Bishop Tutu said, here in Africa, every child beginning at the age of three know what happened in Africa. Not only are we talking about it and educated in the schools, but our plays, all forms of artistic expressions tell the story of what happened in Africa. And then, 
Bishop Tutu said, no, John Hope Franklin said that we have really complicated our situation. And Bishop Tutu said, yes, y'all have not made peace with your past. And so I say to you, we need to have these conversations regardless of how hard they are to be able to do like what happened in Africa, to make peace with our past. <coughs> and so we look at where we are now. We are at a crossroads. And at any given time, our young people can take either one of those paths. One of the paths will set us up to relive the trauma of hate in this country. But the other path, I hope all of us are on, is that path of forgiveness. This organization, 30 years ago, began to really talk about racism in order to be able to create a healing process. And so as I look at the vision statement for the lynching site project, I notice within the vision statement as well as the mission statement, the word healing appeared three times. This organization truly believed that it really doesn't matter how white your skin is or shades of brown. The history in this country, what happened in this country, have hurt all of us. And we need to find spaces that we could come together to begin to heal those hurts. And so I say to you, according to the mission statement from the lynching site, to just site three, number one, that we need to build a relationship of trust and new understanding among all those who choose to be a part of this work. It didn't say black or white, it said all those that want to be a part of this work. Within that statement, it says, to partner with others in Shelby County who are also working for racial healing and truth. And I say to you, without truth, there can be no healing. And last, from the mission statement, to make available groups and classes where the deeper, more difficult conversations about race and racism can take place. And that's where the center come in. That's what we have been on the road to doing. And then I say, people of Center, Texas, people of Center, Texas, and people of this whole nation, it is time for us to go deeper into our religion, to really examine our belief systems in order to be able to be more productive in dismantling the forces that keep us apart. And to the members of European descent, it is time, if you have not already, realize that your redemption is fundamentally linked to the redemption of people of color, your brothers and sisters of color. Once we realize this, we can then be about the business of really reciting with conviction one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I thank you so much for having me. Thank you. To Delbert Jackson for inviting me. And for all of you that gave up such a beautiful day to be on the inside. And I want you to remember me as the woman that I didn't come here to look good, although I can do that. <laughs> I came here to make you feel. And if I've done that, then this trip to Center, Texas, 
was not in vain. Thanks, church.